Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, in God's providence, I am also teaching out of Romans today. So the text under review in my sermon will be Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. Again, that's verses 5 through 11. Defeat in the Christian life is pervasive in our churches today. Christians are living a defeated life primarily because of the weight of sin. This is a problem. Think of the example of pornography in our churches. Perhaps you yourself struggle with it. But we all know of plenty of people that do struggle with it today in our churches. It is an epidemic. It is a problem. And generally, when you meet a, meet a Christian who is trying to pursue the Lord, the problem is, is that this recurring problem with pornography just comes back and back and never, it never ends. They're constantly waging war against this sin that they cannot free themselves from. And generally what happens is eventually that war, they sort of just give into it. And you begin to hear words like, I give up. I just can't fight it anymore. It's not worth it. One day Christ will set me free from this old body of sin. Everybody else does it. It's not as bad as this. These are words of defeat that are way too common in our churches today. You as pastors or ministers or future ministers, we may not be dealing with this exactly or out, outward overt sins per se, but we may be dealing with things of idolatry of the heart. We may be putting things before our eyes or into our ears that we know are not pleasing to the Lord, things that maybe used to bother our conscience and no longer do. It's very easy for a minister to slip into a state of complacency in regards to sin. Well, I say to you, this is a problem. It shouldn't be this way. And if we, if we have any chance of getting set free from it, there's something we need to, to do. It's what we need. We need to remember something. And specifically, the cure to this problem of this defeated life under the weight of sin in our lives, in our churches today, is a remembrance of the gospel. The Christian is free from the power of sin. This is imperative for understanding. This is what we will be seeing specifically in our text today in Romans 6, is that the solution, the cure to this defeated life is a remembrance of the fact that the gospel has set the Christian free from the power of sin. Now, why can I say this? Because the Bible says that because Christ died to sin, the Christian is no longer a slave to sin. Read with me, if you will, to verses 5 through 11. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So my first major point, something I really want to bring out, is that we have to, we have to gain a foundation, and it is that the gospel is determined not according to our experiences and is not determined according to our understandings, but the gospel is determined according to Scripture. And so... We know the word gospel is used quite flippantly in our churches today, perhaps quite superficially at times. So if I were to ask one of you what the gospel means, you might say something a little different than what I would say, or, or even differences within denominations. And so it's important for me to tell you what I mean by the gospel if we're going to find this cure, the cure that I'm referring to. So chiefly, I would say the gospel is the gospel of God. It is his gospel. It is his message. It is a proclamation of what his son has done, his life, his death, his burial, in his resurrection. But chiefly in our text today, we are dealing with what that objective message has done, this, this proclamation of his work, what its effects are for us. Um, I, again, I mentioned this idea, there's, there's three aspects of the gospel that I wanna, I wanna drive home here, is that it's objective, it's historical, and it's completed. What I mean by the fact that the gospel is objective, I mean that the message as it is presented in the text of scripture is objectively true for all people, regardless of what we have to say or think or believe about it. It's true. It's true for all people, and it is defined not by us, but by Scripture itself. It is defined by God. It is historical, simply meaning that it happened in a moment in time and has eternal significance as well. And lastly, it is completed. Everything that was needed to reconcile sinners to God has been completed to the full. Everything that was needed to save us from our sins and the consequences of our sins has been taken care of in the gospel, in his completed 
work. The gospel is objective, it is historical, and it is completed. Now, this message, this objective, historical, completed message, this is the object in which we rest our faith. Faith always has an object, and what we are so prone to do is place our faith in something other than the object of the gospel, the objective, completed, historical gospel. So what we tend to do is we tend to muddle our understanding according to the gospel. And so we, we kind of have this mixed, this mixed uh, this, this confusion that happens, and we want to avoid that. So I want you to delineate between your personal understanding of the gospel while we go through this text, and let's see how Paul defines the gospel and specifically how Paul defines the Christian lives in light of the gospel. And then afterwards, let's try to realign our understanding accordingly. Now, before we understand exactly what's going on in, ver- in chapter 6, we have to understand the argument that Paul has been building. For those of you who are quite aware, the book of Romans is generally broken down into three main sections. Verses one, uh, chapters 1 through 8, 9 through 11, and 12 through 16. Well, we're working in that first section, toward the latter end of that section. But what Paul's doing is he's building an argument that really started in verse 1, and it comes to its climax in chapter 8. But where we find ourselves, the only way we're really going to understand what Paul is referring to here is if we understand what Paul has said prior to this, specifically verses 1 through 4 in chapter 6 and chapter 5, but all the way from the beginning. So in verses 1 through 5, there's essentially this, this overwhelming message that everyone is in need of a foreign righteousness. Everyone, both Jew and Gentile, are in need of a righteousness outside of themselves. And it is given not through the law, not through ignorance of the law, but it is given by faith. It is given to those who specifically place their faith in Christ. This foreign righteousness is then given to the person based upon belief and nothing else. At the end of chapter 5, you see that there is essentially two different types of people in this world. There are those who are in Adam, and there are those who are in Christ. Now, those who are in Adam are find themselves in Adam, both Jew and Gentile, like the whole human race, simply by being born. And we see that through Adam's one sin, sin entered the world back at the fall in chapter 3 of Genesis. And, and, and it sort of affected all of us for all eternity, all of us in this time where we find ourselves right now, both Jew and Gentile. There is nothing that separates from the fact that we have inherited some sin that entered the world through then. But chiefly, what this sin has done is the consequence is death, eternal death. But what Paul's bringing out here in chapter 6 is that what, what this, this reign of death also does is it has sin as its master. Sin is the controlling master among everybody who finds themselves in Adam. And what you see is because of the gospel, because of what Christ has done, there's now a new position made available. So you have a position in Adam and now you have a position in Christ. This is very important for us to understand this because the person who is in Christ is no longer ever going to be able to go back to their position in Adam. They are forever cut. They are in a whole new state of being. They are in a whole new age. They are now found in Christ. And whereas where they were in Adam, the ruling reign was sin. When they're in Christ, the rule and reign is grace. And grace is all about freedom. In verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6, we see that one who is found in Christ is found in Christ through their conversion baptism experience. And what he's basically just saying is he's addressing an objection that says, well, you know, if grace is all that it's all about, if I was saved by grace and all I have to do is believe, then it really doesn't matter what I do. And I take this to be a Christian. I take this to be a Christian just like me who has a very demented mind. And sometimes my logic can go a little too far. And I say, you know what, I guess you're right. If grace always triumphs over sin, I might as well just sin more so grace may abound. It's this idea of saying, it's almost complacency. It's just, all right, it doesn't matter what I do. Right? Is that what you're saying? And Paul, instead of going outright condemning such a person, he just looks at them and says, you you just are not getting what I'm saying. There are so many implications of what I have just laid out for the fact that you are no longer in Adam, but you are now in Christ. But chief among those is you are no longer a slave to sin. You are just not getting it. And and, and so uh, let me give you an example. So let me tell you what I'm not saying, and this is important. You guys are all familiar with the contemporary epidemic known as the sex trade. Well, the sex trade, as atrocious as the sin is around the world, and it is around the world, but it's also found here in the United States. I mean, we could talk about all day long just how how sad it is. But I want to narrow down specifically upon one specific aspect that my wife brought up to me the other day, and it just blew me away. But after I thought about it, it made more sense. Did you know it is not uncommon, it may be rare, but it is not uncommon for women who have been set free from their old master in the sex trade to once in their new position of freedom to, by their own admission, become prostitutes. 
I mean, I, I thought about that and I said, why would somebody who has been set free from the slavery to the sex trade just go back into it? Now, again, I'm saying this is not the case, what I'm just dealing with here today, but I, 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 there's a whole host of reasons that might go into why someone would go back. But I say to you that chief among them is all that person has known, all that poor woman has known is the sex trade. It's who she's identified herself with. and She's never made a clean break. And now, by her own admission, she chooses to go back. It's a sad, sad state of affairs, but it's, it's the truth. And that's not what's going on here in verses 5 and 6 of Romans. <clears throat> so let's read verse 5, please. The second point here is that the Christian is no longer a slave to sin. Um, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, the we here, again, it's referred to everybody I just mentioned. He's referring back. The antecedent here of we is everybody he just spoke of in chapters 6, 1 through 4 and preceding. It's everybody through their conversion baptism experience who have been united with Christ. When we were buried, symbolically, in our baptism, in water, we were, in essence, being united with Christ's death. And when we were raised out of the water, we were united with Christ's resurrection. He's speaking of the Christian, the one who has been through their conversion baptism experience, pulled out of Adam, put into Christ, who has received the righteousness of Christ and is in right position before God. This is who he's referring to. We need to understand that. Now, while that is us as Christians, we need to understand specifically what he's defining the Christian in this text. Let's separate ourselves from it just a little bit, and you'll understand why that makes more sense in a bit. Read verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Here the Christian is defined as one who has been united with the benefits of Christ's death. You see, so we could just say, oh, yeah, right, I was united with his burial and his resurrection, but what does that really mean? And what Paul is bringing out of the text and out of the gospel for us here is he's saying that that actually means that that body of sin, that person you were in Adam, was crucified. It has been put to death. There's nothing left to it. It is dead. As Christ died, the person you were in Adam is dead. It's very important for us to understand. He's also saying that the body of sin that remains in us all, that human faculty that is found in every single one of us, that is so prone to wander, that is so inclined towards sin, it still remains. But he says because of that body that you once had being put away, you are no, that, that, that sin that remains has been disarmed, it has been nullified, it has been brought to nothing. It's lost its reigning power that it once had under the reign of sin. It's very, very important. Read verse 7. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Christ has died, therefore the Christian is no longer a slave to sin. For one who has died cannot live in a state of continual sin. That's what he's saying. You just can't. It's, it's incongruent with who you are. It's no longer who you are. That old self that sinned all the time is dead. And this is what he's saying. This could be quite offensive to a lot of our understanding of things, but this is what Paul is saying. So let's understand the message and not get ourselves and our experiences mixed up here. Martin Lloyd-Jones gives this wonderful depiction of what's going on here. He describes two fields. You have one field with workers separated by a road with another field with workers. In this field over here, you have... Um, the reign and power of sin. It is the kingdom of Satan. He controls these workers. They are slaves under his power. And across the road, you have a, a whole other set of workers and a whole other master. And the master in this field is grace. It is the kingdom of Christ. It is the kingdom of God. And every so often, you have one who is brought out of this field, this worker, bought out of this field from that master and placed under a whole new master. Their position is one now under the authority of a whole nother being in a whole nother position. And he explains kind of what's going on here for those of us who fall into a defeated life, those of us who fall victim to temptation or give up under the weight of sin and just kind of go into sin and just stop caring. What he's saying is that every so often, a worker who has been transplanted over to this field can still hear his old slave master on the other side of the field. And, and the temptation is to listen to that master. And because of the body of sin that remains, the body of sin that only knew sin, 
the body of sin that has been nullified at times, we as Christians, and I think we can all agree, fall victim to listening to those old masters. And this is exactly what he's saying is explaining here. The Christian cannot go back to the old field. He cannot, because it says the evil one cannot touch us, and no one will snatch us out of his hand. We are forever secure in this whole new position that is in Christ. Unlike the woman in the slave trade example, she can go back. We, now, we as Christians, when we're set free from sin, it's forever. It's broken forever. This is very, very, very important to remember. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness that is God the Father. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You see how it works? It's God's grace. It's God's power. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that raised us from the dead. It's very, very, very great. So let's read verses 6 and 7 one more time. Just settle it in. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. When you were a slave, as a Christian, when you were a slave, a worker in this field, when you were in Adam, you had no choice but to say yes to sin. You were controlled. You were a slave. But this is something that I want to bring out, and this is something I have never been told in my life by a soul, is that now that you are in Christ, you no longer have to sin. You can now say no. It's not about do's and don'ts right now. That's not even what Paul's saying. He's saying because of who you are, based upon what Christ has done, the good news is that you don't actually have to listen to that voice anymore. That's really good news. Because so often a person who is defeated is just I cannot stop listening. And the news that he's presenting before us here is that you don't have to submit yourself anymore. You can say no for the first time. And it's because of the gospel. My third point. The Christian is now freed to serve God. Read verses 8 through 10. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. The Christian here is defined as one who has been set free to serve God. I don't know about you, but this is liberating for me because for those of you who have the Holy Spirit, us Christians, all of us who have given the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, what we desire most is to please the one whom we love. And one of the things that beats down a person who is living a defeated life under the weight of sin is condemnation of not being able to please and obey the one whom loved us first. And we get to here. What it's saying is that we now can say yes to God. We can say no to sin, and we can say yes to God. You, as a Christian, can say yes to God, whereas before, you couldn't. Again, the proclamation, because of what he did, because of his resurrection, we can say yes to God, and that is great news. So not only has Christ's death guaranteed an eternal break from the power of sin from the Christian, but the resurrection has empowered the Christian to live a righteous life to God. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians 2. We'll read verses 11 through 15. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing them over them in him. There's two things I want to bring out of this text. Is again, God made us alive. It's his power that we place our faith in that empowers us to live to God today, to live righteously before him. And in verse 15, in there, it says that the disarmament of the rulers and authorities, the things that once ruled your life, he has disarmed. And he did it on the cross. And we, through our unition with Christ, have received those benefits. 
This is wonderful news. It's just basically saying that you, you're the old person that you used to be, that is no longer your identity. It's gone. And the person that you are now, the new man that you have put on in Christ, it is living to God, and it is empowered by God. And the same power that transferred you is the same power that sustains you. Wonderful. So the Christian here is one who has been united with Christ. This Christian is one who is dead to sin, yet alive to God. Verse 11 in Romans, please. It says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is where we are called to realign our understanding of our relation to sin according to everything that Paul has just said. If you remember in the beginning, I kind of talked about let's separate ourselves from the message that he's presenting. Who is the we? Who is the Christian that he's referring to? Remember, it's the person who has placed their faith in Christ, the person who has received this foreign righteousness. It is a person who has been taken out of Adam and is now forever, eternally found in Christ. It is one who, through their conversion baptism experience, has been united with not just the death and resurrection of Christ in an abstract sense, but also received the benefits of that, name, namely, death to sin and life to God. This, this is the person he's referring to. And so you see this contrast. And so you see the problem is, if you're living a defeated life, or you know someone that is leading a defeated life, do you see this contrast? Because a Christian is one who's victorious over sin, according to this text. That's what it says. And we, have to, we have to understand what it says. And if we're living a life that's contradictory to what the Christian is in Scripture, we have to realign our understanding. Now, this is not a condemnation on you. He is not addressing it. He's not saying, oh, you're condemned, you're going to hell. He's saying you who are Christians live in the position that you already are. He's saying from this position that you have already been given by grace through faith, from this position in Christ, live as Christians. Reckon all these things that I say are true of the Christian to be true of you. Let it settle into your being. It's very important. He didn't, you know, this is the first command of Paul's after five and a half chapters of doctrine. It's pretty interesting. And the command itself isn't the typical command that we think. Do this, do this. What does it mean to reckon or to consider ourselves? What does that mean? And it's exactly what I'm saying. It really means you put your faith in that objective doctrine that he has just laid out. That's what he's commanding us to do, to just believe what he's just said is true of the Christian and believe it to be true of ourselves. It's powerful. People you are ministering to need to hear this. I have never been told that I was set free from the power of sin in a way that made sense. You need to tell them that they can say no now. Don't tell them what they can't do, what they need to do. Just tell them they can say no. Tell them what Christ has already guaranteed them. And also the person you minister to, tell them that they can say yes to God. It's wonderful. Wonderful news to know that you can serve the one who you want to serve solely by not your strength, not your war, but, but the war that was already completed and fulfilled in the cross. You know, I came to the Lord quite dramatically several years ago, and I had a very strong break from my alcoholism, my drug abuse, and other things. And as time went by, that desire, that's, that, that sin, that, that desire for sin, that body of sin that still remains in me like it remains in the rest of us, began to desire those things again. And I found myself waging war against sin all over again that I hadn't for some time, namely alcohol, sexual things, pornography, all sorts of problems. And what I, what I discovered was that the more I fought it, the more I failed. And as a result of my continual trying to fight and overcome my sin on my own, what I did was fell under a condemnation that made me want to run away from God in fear. It wasn't until I understood that the gospel already did it for me, that Christ already did everything for me, that I now just had to rest in what he had done, but specifically what we're talking about today, that I no longer had to wage war against sin because he's already disarmed it waging that war from a place of victory rather than trying to attain victory changed it all. And so I want to tell you guys too, if you are struggling with pornography 
or you're struggling with any sort of idolatry in your life, maybe it's the way you treat a spouse, or maybe it's what you eat, or how you treat your body, or, or whatever it may be, I say to you, you don't have to listen to that voice anymore. You don't have to. You can say no. And you can live righteously, and you can please the one that you love. Everything that is needed to overcome sin has already been accomplished. It's been accomplished in the objective, historical, completed gospel of Christ. I plead with you to realign your understanding of who you are in him in light of that. I can say these things, that we are free from sin because the Lord Jesus Christ died to sin. You are no longer a slave to sin.